Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Verily, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our actions. And we send Allah's blessings and peace upon our dear Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and companions. As to what follows, my dear brothers and sisters, indeed the fast of Ramadan is obligatory upon us. But how many of us know what is the proper way to fast and what are the etiquettes of fasting and what invalidates a fast and what must we do in order to fast properly? So today's short episode will be a little bit about the legal issues pertaining to the fasting of Ramadan. The first question is, who is exempt from the fast? And by asking the question, who is exempt from the fast, we understand the default is that everybody must fast. Every single Muslim is required to fast. Who is exempt? Well, of course, first and foremost, the exemptions of all religious obligations are upon children and those who are mentally incapable of thinking properly. In other words, you have to be uh, an adult. And what an adult means, by the way, my two brothers and sisters, is not 18 or 19. An Islamic adult is somebody who has reached puberty. And reaching puberty occurs any time between the ages of 11 to 14 or 15. This is when puberty is reached. So when a child reaches puberty, that child is qualified as an adult in Islam. So an adult is obliged to fast. Likewise, a person who is mentally uh, insane, he is exempt from the fasting. So children and mentally insane people are exempt. Uh, another category that is exempt from fasting are those women who are in their monthly cycles or who are still uh, suffering from the bleedings of childbirth after they have given birth. So those women who are in their monthly cycles, they are exempt from fasting. In fact, they are not allowed to fast. Unlike children who may fast and they will be uh, rewarded for it and their parents will be rewarded for it. But women in their monthly periods are not allowed to fast. It is forbidden for them to do so. So they need to make up those days after Ramadan is over. Just a note of caution. My dear sisters, many sisters misuse uh, this understanding and when their menses finish and they see the white discharge they are lazy in taking a bath and they delay it a day or two and then they take a bath thinking that the obligation of fasting starts when they take a bath but this is not true the obligation of fasting starts at the discharge that finishes their period this is when they are obliged to fast from the next day so do not delay in taking a bath the other category of people who are exempt from fasting are the uh, travelers. So those who are traveling. What constitutes a travel? Anything that you in your culture consider a travel. So commuting to your daily work would not be a travel because you're doing this daily. But going to a neighboring city or town or taking a plane or taking a bus to another place, this constitutes travel. Now, realize, if the travel is easy, like you're sitting in an air-conditioned plane, that doesn't mean that you have to fast because the condition for leaving the fast is that you be traveling, not that the traveling be difficult. And this is the mercy of Allah. Allah has made the religion easy for us, so don't make it more difficult. If you are traveling, you are exempt from fasting. Should you fast, should you not fast, it is up to you. If you want to fast and you find it easier to be fasting, go ahead. But realize, as the Prophet said, it is not piety just to be fasting while you're traveling. In and of itself, it's not extra righteousness. But for some of us, for example, let me give you an example. Suppose you have a plane that is leaving at 5 o'clock uh, in the afternoon, and your iftar is at 6 o'clock. So you think to yourself, if I have to fast all of this time, because you have to fast if you haven't left your city until 5 o'clock, and I only have one hour left, I might as well complete the fast. In this case, it makes sense, you go ahead and complete the fast. But if you have uh, a difficult journey, if you have a, a, a troubling time, then of course it is better for you not to fast. And the general rule is that a traveler is exempt from fasting. Therefore, there is no need to fast. What do you do? You make it up when you return back to your house. Another category of people who are exempt from fasting are those who are sick. And the sick person has two categories. The first are those who are sick with a temporary sickness. Now, what does it mean to be sick, by the way? Sickness here means that fasting would make your sickness worse. It doesn't mean that if you have a small cut and you have a band-aid that, oh, this I am sick, now I cannot fast. It doesn't mean you have a very slight uh, a headache or a sore uh, a thumb or something that you cannot fast. No, a sickness that is affected by your intake of food and water, a sickness that would uh, make the fasting extremely difficult. It doesn't have to be life-threatening, it doesn't have to be extreme, but it does have to be related to the fast. 
For example, if you have a fever, a fever is a type of sickness that you need your medication, you are not able to fast without making yourself feel much more worse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made the religion so difficult. So for example, a fever is a temporary sickness. And another sickness is a permanent sickness. For example, a person has uh, a, a, a diabetes and they have to take an intake of food. And that will be a permanent sickness. A person has cancer or a person has something that requires medication and there is no cure uh, uh, in, in the near future. Or a person might be extremely old and extremely weak and that is considered to be a permanent type of sickness in the sense that he will not be cured or she will not be cured. So if a person is permanently sick, diabetes or extremely old, in this case they may give food to the poor for every day that they do not fast. So for every single day they do not fast, they feed one poor person. Okay, this is if you are permanently sick. Every day, one person. It doesn't mean, by the way, that for every day you have to find a poor person and give it to him. You may add all of the days together. For example, if you're not fasting the entire month, that's 30 days usually, or 29 depending on the month. Uh, so you, you take this amount and you may give all of the money to the poor on one day. Or you may hold the feast for the poor people. Now remember, this is for the poor. You cannot hold the feast for your family and relatives and say, I've done my job. This money must go to the poor. So you feed 30 people in one day, you have done your job. Or you feed 30 different people in one day, you have done the job. You feed 30, the, the same person 30 times in the month, you have done the job. Basically, 30 meals must be given. Whether they are given on one day, or 15 days, or 30 days, is besides the point. You must feed 30 people. The ideal thing is to give them food. What type of food? The food that your culture considers to be an average food item. So if your culture eats chicken and rice, you give them chicken and rice. If chicken and rice is a luxury item, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about staple food. In some cultures, fish and rice. In some cultures, lentils and, uh, and bread. In other cultures, whatever it is. The average food of the average person of your culture, this is what you are required to feed the poor person every single day. You make one meal. So this is if you are permanently sick. And you don't make up the fast because there is no making up. You will never uh, leave the sickness. The second we said is a temporary sickness, such as a fever. Uh, and this fever, you know it is going to go away in five days, in two days, and uh, in a week, it is going to leave you. If you are sick temporarily, you do not have to feed the poor at all. However, you must make up the fast later on. Okay, so this is the difference between the two types of sicknesses. A permanent sickness, you feed the poor. And included in permanent sickness is old age. A temporary sickness, you don't fast, but you make it up when you are fine. So for example, you have a fever for one week. For that week of Ramadan, you do not fast. As soon as you, the fever is over and you're feeling fine, you may fast the rest of the month. When Ramadan is over, Eid is over, you have to make up those six, seven days that you missed after Ramadan is over. This is another category of people who are exempt from fasting. And the final category that we will talk about is uh, the one that there is the most uh, controversy over, and that is the pregnant uh, women and breastfeeding women, those who still have children that are feeding uh, from their mothers. This category, realize firstly, my dear sisters in Islam, just because you are pregnant or breastfeeding, it doesn't mean that you're off the hook, that you don't have to fast. Rather, if you find fasting extremely difficult, or if you find that if you fast, you, will, you might faint because you, are, you need the food, or that the doctors sometimes say that your child is in a critical state and you should not deprive them of food for uh, 9, 10, 12 hours, especially in countries where uh, the fasting is extremely long. And this you need to go to a reputable Muslim doctor. In this case, then you are exempt from fasting. Should you uh, make it up or should you give food? Scholars have differed. Some scholars say this, others say that. I personally follow the position that you should make up the fast after uh, your pregnancy is over and after the breastfeeding is over. And we will continue, inshaAllah ta'ala, talking about the rulings of fast in our uh, next show. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Verily, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings that He has given us. And especially in this month, the blessing of Ramadan and witnessing Ramadan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our good deeds and to accept from us. As to what follows, 
we were talking a little bit about the, the, the legal rulings pertaining to fasting, and we said that uh, a number of people are exempt from fasting, such as the children and those who are mentally uh, insane, uh, such as those women in their monthly cycles, such as the travelers, and also the sick people, and we categorize the sick people into uh, two categories. And we were talking also about uh, ladies who are pregnant or are breastfeeding. And I want to emphasize here, just because you have a child that is suckling uh, from you, or that you are pregnant, in and of itself, this is not an excuse to give up fasting. Rather, many women, in fact, the majority of women should have no problem fasting and uh, in a state of pregnancy or fasting uh, and feeding their, uh, their children. Now, if, for example, a, a sister finds out that towards the end of her fast, uh, her, her milk is running dry and the child does not have uh, milk to drink from, then she should see, is it possible for her to extract this milk and store it uh, for a later time, or does she mind maybe giving one or two bottles only towards the end of the uh, uh, of the fast, and then the rest of the time she feeds her natural milk uh, to the child? But if she feels very strongly, and it is not possible for her to uh, express her milk and store it, it is then permitted. It is permitted for her to. Uh, avoid the fast uh, for the sake of the child. Similarly, if a pregnant sister finds it extremely difficult to fast, she gets dizzy, or a reputable Muslim doctor tells her that it is not safe for the child to be deprived of, of food for so many hours, even though once again, generally speaking, the average pregnancy should not face any such issues. But in extraordinary situations, uh, this might indeed arrive. In this case, we said uh, the woman is exempt from fasting. The question now arises, should she give money to the poor, food to the poor, or does she have to make it up? And here the scholars have differed, and the opinion that I lean towards, uh, and it seems to be the most uh, common sense one, is, the, is that she is temporarily sick, she takes the verdict of the one who is temporarily sick, and so she must make up those days when she is healthy. After her pregnancy is over, after uh, the, uh, the child has been breastfed, she may then make up those days. Even if it is an entire month, well then everybody else was fasting when she wasn't. So now that she is fine, she must fast those 30 days, even though there is some difficulty in that. The next question that arises, what are those issues that breaks the fast? Well, obviously intending to break the fast breaks the fast. So intending or intention is a necessary condition for the fast. When you go to sleep at night, your intention is to fast tomorrow. You don't have to make an intention every single night. When the month starts, you know you want to fast the month. That is your general intention of fasting. But if you intend on any particular day, I'm not fasting anymore. Obviously, that intention uh, breaks the fast. But what are the physical acts that, breaks the that, that break the fast? Two primary acts. The first of them, eating and drinking while you know that you're in a state of fasting. Knowing that you're fasting and you still eat and drink and you swallow, this breaks the fast by unanimous consensus of the scholars. However, you may, while you're fasting, taste something for a reason, as long as it doesn't go beyond your throat. You may also chew something to give to your child, for example. In those days, uh, they, did, they did not have any way to process food. They would take a date, for example, and chew it, and then give it to the baby to swallow it, who didn't have any teeth uh, to, to, uh, to chew it on. So this type of thing is allowed, but it is discouraged. And it is allowed with the condition that it doesn't go beyond the, the, the throat. In other words, it is not swallowed. Putting something on your tongue does not invalidate the fast. Letting it go into your body through the, uh, the throat, this is what invalidates the fast. If, however, you eat or drink not remembering that you're fasting, you pass by uh, a water fountain, you pour some water and you drink, somebody says, you're fasting, how could you do that? You are forgiven because it was accidental. You weren't realizing that you were fasting, so if you do it accidentally, it is forgiven from you. Another thing that breaks the fast is uh, sexual intimacy. Now this we have to be a little bit explicit here because a lot of questions arise. Realize that what breaks the fast is the actual penetration. In other words, the male organ enters the female organ. Everything below this that doesn't actually uh, lead to intimacy or that doesn't lead to uh, orgasm either, it doesn't lead to actual ejaculation, that is forgiven. So a, a, a man kissing his wife or a man hugging his wife or even fondling his wife or even doing more than this into sexual foreplay, even though this might be discouraged if you think it will break the fast, it will lead to that which is uh, not allowed in this state, in and of itself it is permissible. A man may kiss his wife while they are fasting, a man may hug his wife and even do more than this as long as actual penetration does not occur or one of them climaxes. Even if penetration doesn't occur but a man climaxes intentionally, 
uh, he does it himself or uh, he does it playing with his wife or foreplay, this breaks the fast because you caused it. If you're sleeping and a man has a wet dream, this is forgiven because it's not in your hands. So actual penetration or actual self-induced uh, orgasm, this is what breaks the fast. Anything lesser than this does not break the fast in and of itself. How about injections? Or how about uh, taking a spray for those who have asthma? The scholars have differed greatly about this. Realize there's no Quran and Sunnah, there's no Hadith about these issues. So the scholars have differed greatly about this issue. But uh, it appears to be the case that when it comes to asthma, uh, when you have to take those breathing uh, uh, apparatuses, these things do not break the fast because there is more air in it than anything else. So the air goes to the lung. And so this is forgiven, inshaAllah ta'ala. There is no issue at all with this. It is forgiven because it is not a nutrient. And this is, as we said, uh, an issue of, of difference of opinion. But this is the opinion of the majority of scholars. With regards to injections, then the scholars have also differed greatly about it, and this is not the time and place to uh, get into that. However, the position that appears to make the most common sense, uh, and this is the position that, uh, that uh, I follow, is that injections are permissible as long as they are not injections of nutrients, i.e. glucose, for example, into the blood. So any other type of injection that is done, for example, you have to take an operation and they inject a part of your body, a uh, dental operation to make it numb, for example. This injection is permissible because it is not a nutrient. You are, your fasting is not affected by it. In and of itself, an injection does not break the fast because uh, it is, does not go through the throat and it does not provide you nutrients. However, if you take a glucose injection to feel stronger, obviously you are trying to cheat uh, the, the, the fast and that's not uh, appropriate. What we said is a medical injection given for a, a legitimate reason. This in and of itself does not break the fast. Some of the uh, etiquettes of, of, of fasting. First and foremost of the etiquettes of fasting is to have a meal before dawn. We call it suhoor or the sahri. We have to have a meal before the dawn. If you don't have a meal, you have deprived yourself of a lot of blessings. The Prophet ﷺ said, the angels send their blessings upon those who have this early dawn meal. The angels love it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the difference between us and the other nations is we have a late meal in the morning and an early meal at night when we're fasting. We delay the early morning meal to the very end, right before Fajr. And we make the breaking of the fast right at Iftar. Now this means that suppose Fajr is at 5.30, then we should have the meal around 5 o'clock for example, wake up and have a meal, and we may eat all the way up until the Adhan of Fajr. And even if the Adhan starts, we are not that strict and precise. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you have a cup in your hand, and you hear the Adhan, finish drinking what you want to drink and then put it down. 30 seconds is not going to invalidate the fast. You, are, you have a cup for a legitimate reason, you are thinking you will finish up drinking. When the Adhan starts, if you have it in your hand, then go ahead and finish it up, what you want to do, and then put it down. This doesn't mean we should delay it till the Adhan every morning. This is an exceptional case. If you have some food that you're still eating, Finish it up within 10-20 seconds, not the 10-20 minutes, but within the time of the Adhan. Quickly finish it up and then you are done with that meal. Similarly, the Iftar, we should be, break our fast right at the beginning of the Adhan. There is no reward to delay the beginning of the Iftar beyond, uh, beyond uh, the, 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 the Adhan of Maghrib. So this is uh, an etiquette of fast that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make the fast easy for us. That we eat as late as possible and then we break our fast as early as possible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the iman and the taqwa and the ikhlas. May He grant us the intention and sincerity to do all of these good deeds and may He accept from us in this month and outside of this month. And inshaAllah ta'ala, I hope to see you next time. Until then, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma <laughs> 